Okay. So, um, I think we finished last time just after uh, the sketch of proof of uh, the theorem saying what was, uh, I mean, computing the critical points. So now I'm going to tell you something now that we know what the critical point is. We are going to go a little bit farther, even though I'm not going to prove it. I'm going to tell you what happens at criticality, what can happen at criticality. So the six is... Uh, critical behavior, an alternative. So the whole point of this section is that I'm not going to tell you what happens. I'm going to tell you, okay, either this happens or this happens, but I cannot tell you which one between the two behaviors. And the whole goal of the next uh, weeks will be actually to tell you for which values of Q the first thing happens and for which values of Q the second thing happens. Okay, so the idea is in physics, in physics, if you ask a physicist, okay, what do you mean by a continuous phase transition? The physicists will have different, be, I mean, difference, uh, different, or oh, oh, sorry, answers, uh, depending on who, uh, I mean, what is his uh, area of expertise. So some people will tell you exactly what I told you. So the definition of a continuous phase transition, so property one, leave a little bit of space here, would be that the magnetization at criticality is zero. So. If I look at the random cluster model at PC, then there is no infinite cluster, which exactly corresponds for the POTS model to the fact that you have a continuous, I mean, no spontaneous magnetization. But some people will tell you, if they are more inspired by uh, statistical physics, they will tell you it's that there is no coexistence of phases. There is a unique infinite volume measure which in our context would translate, remember we said that the random cluster model with wired boundary condition and the one with free boundary conditions were extremal, so it would translate into this. So free bond, uh, infinite volume measure is the same as a wired infinite volume measure at PC. So that would be another possible answer. A third answer which would be inspired more by, let's say, the study of the free energy, so people who, have, who uh, do things more in a thermodynamical way, would tell you, well, the derivatives of my free energy are well-defined, basically. My first derivative is well-defined. So it would be the fact that the, what we call the susceptibility is finite. So let's define chi, P, uh, chi of PC. Okay, zero of PC. And it's just going to be the average size of the cluster of the origin. So you agree this is counting the average number of points connected to the origin. And it's going to say, okay, it's a continuous phase transition if this thing is infinite. Notice that a priori there is no reason these things are equivalent. Another person, I mean, physicists very often when they do experiments, they do not end up, I mean, making an experiment exactly at PC. They do an experiment, they are close to the parameter, I don't know, the temperature is close to the critical temperature, but it's not exactly equal to the temperature. So what they end up seeing, usually in this context, is that there is a, what we call a correlation length. So this correlation length is a size below which the model looks exactly like what you should be seeing at criticality, and above which you see that, in fact, you are not critical, in the sense that you see that either the temperature is a little bit too high or a little bit too low. So you are either, either disorder or already mag I mean, in a magnetic phase. So this correlation length, there are many different ways of defining it, but one of the ways to say that 
is the inverse of minus uh, of the limit when n tends to infinity of minus 1 over n times the log of the probability to be connected to distance n. n. So what does it mean? 1 over the correlation length is equal to the rate of decay of this thing. The rate of exponential decay of this thing. So in particular, if this thing doesn't decay exponentially fast, then this is going to be infinite. Okay, and because this is going to be zero. Well, the, the, the fourth condition is exactly that. Psi of PC, so with this definition, then phi of PC, psi of PC is equal to infinity. So there is an infinite correlation length. And if you are more inspired by the geometry of what you see, then in fact, a fifth condition, which would be natural, would be to say that somehow there is some kind of scale invariance in my model. If I look at my model from twice farther, I see the same thing, roughly. And Here it will translate into the following thing. If I look at the probability that there is a crossing in a rectangle, then this probability is not going to, I mean, theoretically, we would like to say this probability is going to converge when n tends to infinity. The only problem is that we don't really know how to do that, so we are, are going to do exactly like we did for the rousseau seymour wedge for percolation. We are just going to assume that they remain bonded away from 0 and 1. So we are going to assume that, say, I'm going to simplify a little bit. Take a box of size n times 2n and prove that this thing, so there exists a constant c such that this thing is bounded by 1 minus c and is larger than c. But here, so it's going to be at pc and q, Here, I'm going to be very, very uh, careful about the fact that I'm going to say the following. I'm going to take, in fact, this. I'm going to take, uh, sorry, this existence of a perfect. I'm going to take a slightly larger box, and I'm going to fix whatever boundary condition I want on this box. And you are going to see in a minute why this is not a stupid thing to do. So I'm going to fix psi boundary, I mean, okay, um, yeah. Right. Psi boundary conditions on the boundary of the box, which is slightly bigger. So you just give yourself a, a strip of width n around your smaller rectangle, and you fix boundary condition psi on this. So let's call this the small one, let's call it Rn, and the large one Rn bar. So on this guy, And what I want is that it's true for every psi and every n. So it's uniform in the size, but also in the boundary conditions. Okay? So it's slightly stronger than what you would be asking for uh, the rousseau seymour wedge usually. Usually you would just take the full plane measure and look at the crossing probability. Here we are going to do something slightly better. Okay, so these are some conditions, and the theorem, because so far there is no theorem, is that they are all equivalent. So theorem, let q larger or equal to 1, the following conditions are equivalent. So, the, I mean, it's a theorem which is due to, uh, to myself, to Tassion, and to Sidoravicius. But notice that I'm not telling you that they all are satisfied or that, okay? I, I mean, they, I cannot tell you if they are all satisfied or none are satisfied at this point. That's going to be something we are going to have to work for. Okay, a few remarks maybe on this. So the first one is that 
and, and actually you are going to do them in exercises that P5 is the strongest condition somehow. P5 in price P1, which implies P2, which implies P3, which implies P4. These implications, they are easy. I mean, easy, relatively easy, in the sense that in, a, I mean, in the exercise sheet, you, you will see, um, maybe the one of next week, that you, ca you can do these ones. These ones are not very difficult. I mean, you can already maybe try to understand why, if you take any P, in fact, and you assume that for the wired boundary condition, there is no infinite cluster, why, in fact, this means that this measure with wired boundary condition is the same as the one with free. It's true at any P. And it's a very nice exercise. Then imagine, for instance, that this would be finite, that the expected number of points is finite, connected to zero. Then you could use borel cantelli to say that, in fact, in the dual, you must have an infinite cluster, almost surely. But the dual of the free is the wired. So in the wired, you have an infinite cluster. But since this obviously implies that you don't have an infinite cluster for the free, then you get that this finite implies this is, not, this is an inequality. So this is also an easy implication. This one, so the fact that if you have an infinite expectation, then you are not exponential decay is trivial. So, and this one, that you can go from there to there, it's just because, you see, this is going to allow you to create dual circuits surrounding the origin with positive probability. And you are, you are going to, if you fail at some scale, you can try at another scale and then try at another scale. So you will prove that, in fact, you have infinitely many circuits surrounding the origin. So you don't have an infinite cluster. So this, I will leave it as an exercise. The difficult part is to prove P5 in price P4. Or oh, P4 in price P5, sorry. So difficult. And in fact, what you prove is that non-P5 implies non-P4. So you want to prove that if these quantities either tend to 1 or to 0 for some boundary condition, then you, do not, you have exponential decay. And in fact, what you prove is that if here you take three boundary conditions because these are the smallest one. So if you take three boundary conditions and you look at probability of crossing, if this tends to zero, if this becomes too small, then you can prove exponential decay. Then it decays, in fact, exponentially fast. Then. Okay, so that's it's not easy to do. That's the main part of the theorem. And it's based on some renormalization. Okay, um, so P5 is the strongest condition, and it's going to be very useful. You can do a lot of things with it. In particular, because I mean, you saw that you. I mean. Basically, any theorem you would prove on critical percolation is using the rousseau semmel theory. In the case of, of the random cluster model, this is the right analog of the rousseau semmel theory. It's not just that crossings in the full plane do not go to 0 or do not go to 1. It's really with these boundary conditions which are not far. And I want just to illustrate that to finish this chapter. By a, say, by, by a corollary or proposition, which is that there exists a C such that for every n, C over n is smaller than the probability at PCQ of 0 connected to the boundary of the box of size n, smaller than 1 over n to the C. So, the probability of being connected to distance n decays polynomially fast. So 
So how do we prove that? First, the left inequality. This one is, is easy. Just, I mean, because I understand we are an advanced class and so on, but I just want to say that the class starts at 15. It doesn't start at 30, it doesn't start at 20, okay? Just a question of respect for me. I'm starting at 15, you start at 15. Okay, so the left inequality. So what you do here, well, you can use the fact that you know that crossings are actually bounded away from zero. So what you can say is, okay, let's take the probability that a box is crossed, say n times 2n. I'm going to just drop the PC, Q, and Rn because I'm anyway going to work at this value. And then I say, okay, if this is true, then one of the points here has to be connected to distance n at least. So this is smaller or equal to the sum over the x on the left of my rectangle on this part of the probability that x is connected to the boundary of the box of size n around x. So let's call it x plus boundary of the box of size n. This is an inequality, of course, and it can, it's, it's a rough inequality. But here you see that you have n points and that by translation invariance, this is zero connected to the boundary of the box of size n. So here, notice I took the infinite volume measure instead of the box of size n like that. But remember that if I take free boundary condition on the boundary of this box, well, it's smaller probability than if I take the full plane and I look at the crossing. Okay. So this inequality is, is, is fairly easy. And actually, you could get it from just uh, rousseau seymour welsh in the full plane. What is less obvious is the other inequality. For the other inequality, you want to, mim to mimic what you did for the rousseau seymour welsh so for, uh, for, for percolation. For percolation, what you did is you took a big box and you wanted to say that zero is not connected to the boundary with too good probability. So what were you doing? You were drawing annuli of size, so it's two to the k, two to the k plus one, two to the k plus two, etc. And you were saying in each of these annuli, each of these animals, I have a probability of having a dual circuit surrounding the origin. Each one has probability constant, so you agree if you have this with crossing a rectangle, you can easily construct a circuit in an analysis using the FKG inequality. And then you can pass to the dual to say that it's, okay, you also have dual circuits because PC is self-dual. So here you could do the same and say, okay, so in each of these annulus, I have a positive probability of having um, a dual circuit. So the probability of zero connected to the boundary of the box of size n should be smaller or equal to, well, one minus this probability, let's call it C0, to the number of, annul of annuli, which is basically log two of n. But here I'm cheating quite heavily. Why? Because in the case of percolation, all the, what is happening in these different annuli are, I mean, is independent because it's independent percolation. But here it's not. So here, this is not true in general. What is going to be true is that you can say, okay, it's probability that there is, that does not exist a circuit in the last annulus, let's call it A log 2n. But then it's a probability that there does not exist, I mean, or let's blah, 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 times the probability that there does not exist a circuit, a dual circuit, sorry, in A um, k knowing that there does not exist circuits 
in the A j for j larger than k. The best you can do if you want to prove that the, the probability of a certain intersection doesn't occur is to say, okay, it's the probability that the first event doesn't occur times the probability of the second event doesn't occur knowing that the first one didn't occur times the probability of the third knowing that the two first didn't, etc., etc. If you are independent, this knowing that you can remove it because, uh, because of independence. But a priori, you cannot in general. So the first guy is indeed going to be smaller than 1 minus C0. But now, even this, I mean, let's look at the generic guy. So here it, it carries on. Let's look at the generic guy, this guy. The fact that there is no dual circuit in AK is helped a lot by the fact that there is no dual circuit in AJ for J larger than K. These two events, they are actually increasing, OK? But if they are increasing, then they are positively correlated by the FKG inequality. So these guys, the non-occurrence of these guys, is helping the non-occurrence of this guy. And it could help it a lot. That's the point. Maybe it helped it so much that even though if I would not condition, I would have a probability bounded by 1 minus C0, if I condition, then in fact my probability is very close to 1. Okay? And what this theorem is saying is that this is not happening because even if you take the best boundary conditions for you, you will not have a very good probability of crossing. Even if you take the worst boundary conditions for you, you will still have a fairly good probability of crossing. Okay? So this is the reason why this uniformity of boundary condition is so important. Is that here, this thing is always bounded by the maximum over the possible boundary condition, psi, of this event. So you, you imagine you want to know whether you have a dual circuit here. Well, you, you condition on anything you want on the boundary. You can take the best, best you want. What is the best is going to be the free boundary condition here. So you can fix the free boundary conditions here. Even with free boundary conditions, you do not have a dual circuit with very good probability. That's what this theorem is saying. Okay. So the maximum of psi of and this guy is anyway smaller than one minus c zero. So this you re you recover this. Um, this thing, okay? So it's not a complete proof, of course. I mean, one should be very, very careful and go uh, much slower probably to have this proof. You will do it in exercise, but my point is I wanted at least to convey the idea that this bar uniformity in boundary condition is, is really the, the trick there. Okay, so this is uh, the end of uh, this chapter. And now we are going to try to decide for which values of Q this thing is continuous. And uh, I mean, all these conditions are, are satisfied and for which values of Q they are not. And in order to do that, we need to introduce a new representation, which is called the loop representation of the model. So chapter is uh, four. Loop representation. Of the random cluster model. And here maybe I should be careful of the planar random cluster model. So one of the difference here is that it works only for planar. OK. So let's start. We are going to start by what is easy. Let's look at uh, free boundary conditions. OK, so let's consider so loop representation for free boundary conditions.
So the idea is the following. So let's let G be a finite graph. And let's take omega, the configuration on G, and omega star, the dual configuration on G. Okay, let's draw both at the same time. Try to do something like that. Okay, so let's imagine we start with a Let's say this is my original configuration. So what is going to be my dual configuration? So every edge So we get something like that. So here uh, it's on G star, sorry. G star, because I'm going to work with free boundary condition, what I'm going to say is that I also take all the edges that are around my graph G to belong, uh, I say they belong to G star. And I assume that I open these edges. It's going to be something convenient, but it's not, not very important. So how, how do I draw uh, the loop representation, the loop uh, configuration, which I'm going to denote omega bar, so the loop configuration, it's going to be on a graph called G diamond. So G diamond is defined as follows. You put a vertex at the middle of every edge of your original graph. I'm going to take a little bit of time to actually define this because otherwise you are going to be lost for uh, I mean, probably you will be lost anyway, but it's important to take a little bit of time on this one. So you take a vertex, you put a vertex at the middle of every edge, and then the edges of your graph are just going to be between nearest neighbors. So it's, they are going to be like that, and so on. So you see that you okay. You see that you find a rotated version and rescale version of the square lattice. So this rotated version of the square lattice is called the medial lattice. Okay, it's terribly poorly drawn, but So this, so you, you had Z2, you had this Z2 star, and now you have Z2 diamond, which is this uh, rescale lattice like that. And this guy is called the medial lattice. Okay. And so uh, G uh, diamond is a subset, a subgraph of uh, the medial lattice. Okay, how do I draw now the loop configuration? So the loop configuration is going to be defined as follows. You draw the loops, you draw loops around your medial lattice in such a way, that's not a good color, in such a way that they never cross the edges of omega or omega star. So you always turn at vertices in such a way that you do not intersect the edge present. Notice that at every vertex of my medial graph, I have either an edge of my primal lattice or an edge of the dual lattice coming through this guy. So there will always be only one way to, carry, to, to uh, keep going, to turn in such a way that I do not intersect. So let's try here. So you start here. You need to turn. You need to turn, etc. And here you close a loop. 
And you do that everywhere. So I'm going to be a little bit more, I mean, You really imagine these are loops drawn on the medial lattice, but quickly somehow. Okay, up. And here we have other ones. And here we have a last one, which is going like that. It's not so bad, right? It took me some time, but it's not so bad. So this is the loop configuration of G uh, diamond. Okay, why is it good for? So now, I mean, I have a distribution on, on uh, remember that I have, if I take the proposition, if omega is simple according to phi zero uh, P, I mean G P Q, so if I sample omega according to the random cluster model on G, then I can ask, what is the distribution of omega bar? Because omega bar is just, it's in bijection with omega, right? Omega was in bijection with omega star. And once I have omega and omega star, I have automatically omega bar in a unique way. So I can really look, it's a random variable, I can really look at its distribution according to the random cluster model. And by definition, this distribution, while it's very easy to compute, it is just the probability of omega. But what I would like, I mean, this, this, I can write it like that, but I would like to have something better. I would like to have an expression which involves only omega bar. So can I express it in terms of omega bar? And the answer is yes. It's gonna be up to a constant. Let's put a tilde, it's not the same as before. It's gonna be x to the number of open edges in omega, so this is not so good, times square root of q to the number of loops in omega bar. So here I need to tell you what x is, and so where? Uh, L of omega bar is the number of loops in omega bar. So this is, this is great for us. We express it in terms of the number of loops. We still have O of omega, but it's, two of, it's x to the O of omega, and x is equal to x of pq. It's equal to p over 1 minus p times square root of q. And the observation that you should make yourself right away is that if p equal pc of q, then x equal 1. So at the critical point, this term disappears. And we, we have an expression on omega bar which involves only the number of loops. It's square root of q to the number of loops. And so therefore, for this reason, we are going to just forget about the original configuration now when we work at PC and just work with the loop representation. And in particular, I'm going to now really always identify this phi zero GPQ, which was a priori defined on per collision configuration. Now I'm going to really going to see it as a, measures, as a measure on loop uh, configuration. So now phi zero GPQ can be seen as a measure on loop configurations. Okay, so let, let me try to prove this proposition.
So let's take, I mean, we are only interested, I mean, it's up to uh, normalizing constant. So let's just look at p to the number of open edges, 1 minus p to the number of closed edges, q to the number of clusters. And let's try to express this in terms of x and square root of q and the number of open edges, number of loops. So let's try to make the number of, I mean, x appear. So for that, we just write that 1 minus p is, uh, is 1 minus p to the number of edges minus the number of open edges. And we also divide by square root of q to the number of open edges and multiply by this. So this is equal to 1 minus p to the number of edges in g times square root q to the number of, um, square root q to the number, oh, let's, so far let's uh, keep it like that. So we are going to p over 1 minus p square root q to the number of open edges. And here we get a square root q to twice the number of clusters. And because I uh, divided by square root q to the number of open edges, I need to add plus the number of open edges here. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to say minus the number of vertices in G, and I'm going to multiply by square root q to the number of vertices in G. OK, so when I did that, I have a certain constant here. Then I have x to the number of open edges. And I have square root q to this thing, what is the only thing I need to prove? I need to prove that this thing is just the number of loops in omega bar. So yeah, but twice the number of clusters plus the number of open edges minus the number of vertices is equal to the number of loops. And this, how can we prove that? We can prove that just by induction on the number of open edges. It can be seen by induction on O of omega. Indeed, if O of omega is 0, so if you don't have a single open edge, then what is the number of clusters? The number of clusters is just the number of vertices in my graph, because they are all isolated vertices. And this is also, by the way, the number of loops you will find, because you will have exactly one loop surrounding every vertex of my graph. So this will also be the number of loops in my graph. And we will indeed get twice the number of vertices plus 0 minus the number of vertices equal to the number of vertices. So the, in the, I mean the, the starting, the initiation is, uh, initialization is, is, um, is working. And then if you add an open edge, there are two possibilities. Either you add an open edge between two clusters. You have two Dijon clusters. You add an open edge. What does it do? It reduces the number of clusters by one. It so I increase the number of open edges. So this whole term is decreasing by one. And you can check that if you did that, you had two loops before. One going around like that and one going around like that. And they were separated by the dual cluster that was going like that. If I open this guy, I join the two, the, two, the two loops, and I get only one. So this thing indeed decreases by one. In the second case, what is the second possibility is that this edge, you add it between a single cluster that was doing like that. In this case, you do not change the number of clusters. You increase the number of edges by one. But on this side, before you had exactly one loop going like that, and opening this edge transforms it into two loops. So this is coherent. Okay? 
So this is the end of this proof. So this loop representation is going to be very, very useful. Before I actually use it in the second part of this talk to, um, or do I do that? Yeah, let me do that. Before, uh, before the break, I'm going to just tell you why, I mean, how it came into, uh, why it appeared, this, uh, this. Because somehow it almost appeared before the random cluster model. It's very strange. So imagine you do two more operations. The first one is you oriented the, the loops. You just take a loop and say there are two possible orientations. So let's orient, for instance, this loop like that. So it's going to go like that. This loop is oriented like that. Etc. So from a loop from a loop configuration omega bar, I can give you an oriented loop uh, configuration. So this is a configuration of oriented loops. And now let's just forget how they turn. Let's just keep their orientation on every edge. So from omega bar, go to omega, what I'm going to call six vertex, which is just you forget, forget the uh, turns and just keep the orientation of every edge. OK? By the way, what are the possible configurations you can see at a vertex of the medial lattice, so one of these uh, violet uh, vertex, uh, vertices? So now every edge around it is oriented either inward or outward. But because the loops, when they arrive, they need to go back, they need to go away, you will always have as many loop, I mean, uh, edges pointing inward, the, the, the vertex, and outward. So there are exactly six possible configurations, which are going to be this one, so two pointing inward, adjacent, and two going outward, and the rotations of these guys. So there's going to be this one, this one, and this one. And there are the two others, which are the two pointing inwards are facing each other, and the two outwards are facing also each other, like that. These are the only possible configurations. And if you forget everything I did up to now, what you, could, uh, what you could do here is just say, OK, let's take a model of configurations like that. So it's just orientations on every single edge of my medial lattice. With the constraints, I need that my configuration has a constraint that there are as many edges pointing inward and outwards. And let's say that I give some weights x1, x2, x3, x4 to x6 for every vertex. And I just say the probability of a configuration of six vertex. I could decide it's proportional to x1 to the number of vertices of type 1 times x2, etc., times x6 to the number of vertices of type 6. This gives me a new model. Okay, and the question is, maybe when I do this thing here, I can guess what are the x1, x2, x3, I mean, maybe I can write, when I use these transformations, I can write the law of this guy in terms of x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, x6. Unfortunately, the story is a little bit more complicated because 
You see, up to now, when you were going from, so you, you have omega goes to omega stars, or, and, uh, or omega, yeah, omega, omega stars goes to omega bar. This was a bijection. So this guy, you could see it as a random variable on the original space. Here already, it's, a bi it's not a bijection anymore. Why? Because these guys have a lot, I mean, this guy has a lot of images. You need additional randomness, basically. You need to, uh, you need to um, orient the loops randomly. There is not a thing, you don't want to do it in an arbitrary way. You really want to do it randomly. So there is additional randomness. But here, there is a loss of information. This guy, a six vertex configuration, has many pre-images, if you think about it. Why? Because if I give you this uh, configuration with this type of things, you cannot really reconstruct how the loops turn. In the fourth first cases, these four cases, you can. Because here, the only way the loops turned were like that. Uh, that's, oh, sorry, like that, and like that. These are the only ways. But there, notice that the two ways are possible. You can turn like that, or like that. Both are possible, and same thing here. So my point, what I'm trying to say here, is that there is no, the six, this guy is not a random variable on my original space. I need some additional randomness. So this is, there is no coupling, if you prefer, between the configuration of six vertex and the configuration of, of your original random cluster model. But what you can still do is think only in terms of the partition functions. So you look at the partition function of POTS even, because we even had a POTS model before. We had the sigma here. And the sigma was giving by some kind of coupling omega. So Z POTS at, on G, beta c and q thing was expressed up there was a small constant c0 which was very easy to compute which uh, i'm not gonna it was a random cluster one on g p uh, p c q or let yeah g p c q now this guy this partition function is the sum of the p to the number of point g's one of them this is the sum of these guys on every configuration so it's the sum of, I mean, up to this constant, it's exactly the sum for the loop model. So you can also express this up to a very explicit C1 as something on loops. And on loops, x is equal to 1. And now when you do these transformations, you can also get to oriented loops. It's fairly easy oriented loops and once again when you are going to do the transformation there you're going to also be able to express it in terms of the partition function this times for the six vertex so it's going to be the sum of all possible six vertex configuration of x1 to the number of vertices etc these guys are always uh, renormalizing constant but now the question is, what are the weights that you get? And in fact, if you do carefully the computation, you can check that if you start at x equal 1, then the weights are going to be, you are going to have x1 equal 1, x2 equal 1, x3 equal 1, x4 equal 1. And the other ones, I need to check, it's something like 2 cos of pi sigma tilde. So here you're going to get. Two cos of pi sigma tilde, where cos of two pi sigma tilde is equal square root q over two. So you define sigma tilde to satisfy this equation. So it's actually, maybe I'm going to give it to you as an exercise, because it's really not, I mean, you have to go slowly, but it's, it's really not difficult. There is no, uh, no uh, basically, you can do it yourself. 
So once again, this is a partition function of this new model. But the whole point is that this model was studied a long time ago. It's a very uh, classical model in statistical physics. It's related to a model of ice and uh, things like that on lattices. And the, the important thing is that the free energy of this guy is very well known. So if you take 1 over g times the log of z6 vertex, it converges when g tends to infinity to a certain quantity. And this quantity, let's call it f of uh, q, because it depends only on q. Well, this quantity is the free energy of this guy. And if you think about it, because of all this relation between partition functions, it gives me, in fact, the free energy for the POTS model. But this gives us the free energy at criticality for the POTS model. So there is somehow this miracle that the free energy for the POTS model can be computed. It's possible to compute it. The problem is that you can compute it only at beta critical, because here, in fact, the mapping from here, I mean, this step here, it works only if here you have one, if the xc is one. So only at criticality. And if you want to use, if you remember your class in thermodynamics or in physics in general, when you have the free energy, if you want to deduce the thermodynamical quantities, you need to differentiate your free energy with respect to some of the parameters. For instance, you could try to differentiate with respect to beta. Here I could maybe say beta, I mean, beta CQ. Something. But here you cannot because you only have the expression at beta critical. So it, that, it's not sufficient to give you information on the critical phase. Nevertheless, if you do a few assumptions and you, you work a little bit with your hands, uh, you can predict, and that's what Baxter did, you can predict that uh, the phase transition of the random cluster model is continuous <laughs> if and only if Q is strictly larger than 4. And at least I think you, could, uh, you can have a kind of a hint that this is true, which is here. Because here you see that Q larger than 4 changes a lot what is happening because sigma tilde is not real anymore. It has to become pu I mean, purely imaginary. OK? I never told you that sigma tilde had to be uh, real. OK, so this, was, so this is the first part. So now what we are going to do or start to do in the second part is to prove that for Q very large, you have a discontinuous phase transition. And next week, we will prove that for Q smaller or equal to 4, we indeed have a continuous phase transition. OK, break. So since I went over time, we start again at 25. Okay. Uh, just I, I made a, a, a typo here. Of course, it's smaller or equal to 4. That we want. Sorry. Uh, one, one thing. So next week, we are going to switch the classes with Yvon. I'm, I really apologize for the people who cannot come on, uh, on Tuesday morning. But they will have a nice class by Eva on, on Friday, so it's, <laughs> they are gaining. Uh, so we, we switch, and we switch also the, the TA then. OK, so basically, on, on Tuesday, it will be me, and on uh, Friday, it will be him. OK, he told you that already, right? Or he forgot to tell you? Yes, he told you. Wonderful. He's much more efficient than me, because I almost forgot. OK, so. Try, I mean, this is, uh, I mean, I was reminded by Sebastian that this is really a very nice step. Like, try to see exactly how you could go from there to there 
with the partition functions. It's, it's very, very, uh, actually maybe without any uh, hint, it's not so easy, but, but you can try and then on, uh, on, uh, on Tuesday you will receive uh, an exercise uh, sheet where there will be a few details. But it's, it's a very, very funny uh, thing. Okay, so step, no, we, it's the second part, I guess. So discontinuous, discontinuous phase transition. And here, unfortunately, we don't know yet how to uh, prove for Q larger than four, maybe in a month, but not now. And, uh, but, but we know for Q very large. And that's what I want to prove. And here I should say that this is a fairly old result. It goes back to uh, the 80s. But the proof I'm going to present is a, well, a new proof. I, I mean, it's still inspired by what they are doing. It's always kind of the same, same idea. But the proof that I, I, I found last year, so theorem. For Q larger or equal to 256, uh, the phase transition is discontinuous. And of course, I didn't try to optimize the 256. In fact, actually, the exactly the same proof works for 81 or something like that. But the best result known is 25.72. So just remark. Using what we call the Pirogov Sinai theory, Koteki and Schlossmann proved the result for Q larger or equal to 25.72. Actually, Kotegi Schlossmann did it only for integer Qs, and there was then Mirak Sole and, uh, and uh, co-author that proved it for Q larger than 25.72. Anyway, it's not four, okay? You agree with that? So, <laughs> so let's say that 25 or 20, I mean 256 is basically for physicists is the same number, right? So, so we are gonna do it for this value because here's the proof I think is, is, is uh, faster. And it's based on the same idea. So, proof. Why is it true that for Q very large, you have a discontinuous phase transition? So remember that we know that we will have a discontinuous phase transition if, for instance, we can prove that phi 1 has an infinite cluster. Or if you prefer that phi zero is such that in the dual there is an infinite cluster, right? What does it mean in terms of loops, this? Well, a loop is an interface between a primal and a dual cluster. So if I have finitely many loops in phi zero, then that means that there is either an infinite cluster or an infinite dual cluster. You agree? So observe that if you have, uh, if uh, there, is, there are finitely many loops surrounding the origin, then we have uh, either an infinite cluster or a dual infinite cluster. But notice that if I start from phi zero, I know that phi zero is smaller than phi one. I also told you that there cannot be coexistence of phi zero and phi one. This was a Zeng argument that was saying you cannot have an infinite cluster in phi zero because you would have one in phi one in the dual. So therefore, you would have a coexistence of infinite dual and uh, primal clusters. 
So if I can prove that, then automatically for phi zero, I, uh, for, uh, sorry. Yeah, if I can prove that, then automatically it's a dual infinite cluster for phi zero. Because phi zero at PC of zero connected to infinity is zero, we would deduce well, what we call P1. I mean, non P1, which is phi 1 PC Q of 0 connected to infinity is positive. Or if you prefer, this was actually the definition of being a discontinuous phase transition. So what I need to prove is I need to prove that if I take the graph to infinity and I get this loop measure in the infinite volume, I have only finitely many loops surrounding the origin. That's what I need to prove. And in order to do that, what I'm going to do, I'm going to actually prove something much stronger. I'm going to say, OK, let's fix a loop. What is the probability that it appears in my uh, loop configuration? I'm going to prove that this is very, very, very small. So small that, in fact, even though I have, you know, imagine I can prove that a loop of length n appears with probability e to the minus cn exponential is small in n. How many loops of length n do I have which are surrounding the origin? Surrounding the origin, sorry. <laughs> well, you have at most roughly 2 to the n such loops. So if the e to the minus cn, if e to the minus c is larger than 2, then the probability of having a loop of length n surrounding, surrounding the origin is going to be exponentially small. And in particular, when n tends to infinity, I would have that just by borel cantelli I cannot have infinitely many loops surround, uh, surrounding the origin. I, I will not manage to do it. OK? <laughs> okay? So my goal is to fix a loop and to say, OK, the probability of this loop occurring in my configuration is tiny. In order to do that, I'm just going to first make a, a small thing because I want, let's forget about these orientations, OK? I had a loop configuration like that. I'm going to fix one, or one specific orientation, which is going to be like that. I have my medial lattice, which is like that. Notice that what is in the middle of the faces of my medial lattice? In the middle of faces of my medial lattice, so let's take, for instance, this face, or let's say this face, I have a primal vertex of my, of my graph Z2. And in the middle of this one, I have what? I have exactly a dual vertex of Z2. Uh, so a, a vertex of the dual lattice. So my point is that when I look just at my medial lattice Z2 diamond, half of the faces are associated to vertices of Z2, and half of them associated to vertices of the dual lattice. Let's color those which are associated to the primal lattice black and the other white. So these are the black ones. So these guys, you, you call them black faces. Okay. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to give an orientation to the, to the edges of my medial lattice by saying they are going counterclockwise around the edges of my, I mean, around black faces. I'm fixing like that an orientation, OK? And the observation is that if we, you take a loop configuration, then by definition, because loops are always turning left or right at vertices, this orientation of the edges of the medial lattice, they give you a natural orientation of the edges of the, your loops. So the loops become oriented in a one-to-one -one fashion this time. It has nothing to do with the orientation that we were using here. Okay, so forget about this mapping. It has nothing to do. Here we were just oriented loops in one way or the other. Here it's completely different. I'm fixing an orientation to start with. Okay. Okay, so the lemma is gonna be, it's gonna be the following. I'm gonna prove, so let's L be an oriented loop, I mean, a, contact, an, a, a loop 
oriented counterclockwise. I take a loop oriented counterclockwise. Then the probability at PC Q G on a graph G, and I'm going to take L uh, included in G in G diamond. So I take, of course, a graph which is large enough that I have a loop in it. Then the probability is that L occurs, I mean, appears, appears in omega bar. I'm going to prove that this is smaller than square root Q to the 1 minus the length of my loop divided by 4. That's going to be my lemma. So the longer the loop, the smaller the probability that it occurs in the configuration omega bar. And maybe before I prove that, I'm going to tell you how we conclude from there. Okay? Because it's very simple to conclude from there. So why is it good to have this? Okay. So let's sum over possible loops. So first, if you have this result, so if the lemma is true, just what you can do is sum over all, uh, I mean, let g tend to infinity. Let g tend to z2 we get that the probability at PCQ of 0 of L is in omega bar is smaller than square root Q or Q to the 1 half minus the length of the loop divided by M. Now, if I sum over every L oriented counterclockwise and surround, surrounding 0, if I sum over all these guys this probability, well, this is smaller than the sum over n of the probability that there is a loop of length n surrounding the origin and oriented counterclockwise. These loops, well, a loop of length n surrounding the origin has to pass through a vertex at distance at most n of the origin. And if you start from a prescribed vertex and you, ha you are a loop, you pass through this vertex and you are of length n, well, because at every step you have two choices, you go either left or right, you have less than two to the n such loops, right? So the number of loops of length n surrounding the origin is going to be smaller than n squared 2 to the n. And this is a very rough bound. You could do much better than that. But let's do that. And here, you get a q to the half minus n over 8. Okay, so I'm just using the union bound. That's the stupidest thing you could do to bound this, this thing. But notice that if q is larger than 256, then this thing is finite. And by borel Cantelli, tells us that almost surely there exists finitely many loops um, surrounding zero, which are oriented counterclockwise. So we are almost done. We just need to check that maybe you don't have an infinite number of guys who are oriented clockwise. But what does it mean for this uh, question? What does it mean for a loop to be oriented counterclockwise? 
That means that inside it has some primal cluster. So the loops that are oriented counterclockwise, they are the boundaries of clusters of primal clusters surrounding the origin. They are the exterior boundary of primal clusters surrounding the, uh, surrounding the origin. The loops oriented clockwise, they are the inner boundaries of this. You know, when you have a cluster surrounding the origin, you will have a loop inside. This one will be oriented clockwise, and a loop outside, which is the one oriented counterclockwise. So my point is that they alternate clockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, counterclockwise. So in particular, if you have finitely many oriented counterclockwise, you have finitely many oriented clockwise. Okay? So this would conclude the proof. So there are finitely, finitely many uh, loops altogether. So the only thing I need to convince you of is that this lemma, I mean, is, is this lemma that if I fix a loop, the probability that it appears in omega bar is small. And here I think the proof, I mean, I, I like, I mean, all this is completely straightforward. In an article, you would almost not even mention it if you write poorly. But this is really the heart of the proof. Nothing else is necessary somehow. This is, every proof will do the same there. This is the heart of the proof. And the idea is very simple. So why is it that you don't want a big loop? Well, anyway, whatever the cube, you don't really want a big loop. Why? Because if you take a big loop, you can remove it and replace it by small loops. And every small loop, is going to bring you an additional square root of q because it's the probability of a configuration is square root of q to the number of loops. Okay? So this is, it's always going to be true that you don't really want big loops. So why is it that sometimes you see big loops? Well, you see big loops because if the square root of q is not large enough, then the energy cost that you want the fact that indeed you have a bigger probability when you remove this loop and you replace it by small loops, well, it's not counteracting the fact that you have many big loops. So there is a fight between what we call energy on one side, which is gaining energy by increasing the number of loops, and entropy, which is, okay, you have many big loops. So you have a fight between the two. And what we are saying is that if Q is large enough, the energy gain is so big that you don't care about the entropy anymore. It's beating the entropy. And this is really the idea of the, of the pirogov sinai theory. So that's why this proof, in some sense, is reminiscent of this theory. So here, I want exactly to harness this fact that you want to use the fact that if you have a big loop, you want to replace it by many small loops. The problem is that uh, the problem is that if you remove a big loop, well, it's not clear how you add small loops. Okay, let's remove this loop. Let's uh, maybe like that. So let's say we are working with this loop. This loop here. We want to say that if you remove it, you could add uh, plenty of loops. So, okay, you can do that. Let's remove the loop. But then, in this case, for instance, if you think about it, the only, I mean, there are only two loop configurations, uh, three loop configurations that are, that are corresponding to this thing. You could indeed, <coughs> here, you could cut. You could say this loop configuration, so I take this loop and this small one, is admissible. There is another one, which is this one, where you do like that, and this one is that. And there is the original one with the loop. So if I don't do anything more, if I remove a loop, I have, in this case, only three possible ways of associated loops, I mean, new uh, loop configuration to that. And you don't gain much because you just gain one loop in each case. So this is not so good. But in fact, you can do better than that. Imagine you remove the loop, 
And now you shift this loop, you shift it here. Boom. Okay? I don't know why I make this sound, but that's, that's a little bit embarrassing, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, so so you, you have the loop, you remove it, and what is inside, you shift it like that, by one half, one half. If you do it, I'm not going to draw it because that's not going to work well for me, but if you remove, well, let's draw, no, let's still try it. So you are going to be like that. I don't want to redo the whole, uh, I should have, okay, no, here, like that. So if now th this is the loop, oh, that's much better. Okay, good. Now you notice that in this case, I have actually many, many places where I can add loops because I can add a loop here, 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 and here. So in this context, if I shift the loop inside, I have actually six places, six loops to, to add. So then I really gain a lot. If you think about it, if I shift in another direction, maybe I could get even more loops. So for instance, if I shift this guy here, I'm going to have actually six as well. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's a fade, but that's okay. Uh, you can gain, a priori, you could, if you move in another direction, you could gain even more loops. Because how many loops do you gain when you shift this thing? Well, you gain the number of loops, I mean, you get the number of loops, which is exactly the number of faces that you have, which are now free of, every, uh, of any edge. And these guys, they correspond exactly, if you shift that way, they correspond exactly to all the edges of your original loop that were on, I mean, all the edges of this type that were on your original loop. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply create some kind of what I, what I like to call a repair map. So I don't like the idea. It's, I mean, my configuration is broken. It has a huge loop. I'm going to repair it by doing three steps. So this is a map SL, which goes from this set of uh, uh, omega bar such that L is a loop of omega bar. And it's going to go into just a set of uh, loop configurations. And this repair map, it's going to remove this loop and add a lot of uh, new loops by doing three steps. So step one is going to be remove the loop. Step two is going to be shift the loops inside and shift them. Well, I have a choice. I mean. I start from the loop L. So just look at the shift. So the loop L has a certain number of edges like that, certain number of edges like that, like that, and like that. Just take the number which is the largest. So let's say it's northwest, like that. And shift in the direction southeast. Because this is what is going to give me the most number of, the biggest number of uh, trivial loops after the shift. So this shift uh, the loops inside in the direction, in the best direction. And step three, well, step three, you need to Overwrite, so now what you are going to say is that every edge which is not in the loop configuration anymore, which is empty, you add the small loops around it, the black face that it surrounds. So every edge empty after step two. Add a trivial loop around the black face bordering the edge. <laughs> okay, so you do these three steps. What you need to check is that you get a loop configuration at the end. Okay? Because things could go wrong a priori. What could happen? So you remove a loop. Okay. Now you shift the loop inside uh, the, 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 the original loop, and you overwrite. At the end, I mean, it's not completely, completely obvious that you are going to end up with a loop configuration. 
you need to check that every edge of your medial lattice is actually exactly is, is on one loop and exactly on one loop, not two or more after you overwrap. So you have two difficulties. You need first to check that when you shift, you are not going to, so all the, you agree all the edges outside of L, they do not change. You do not do anything with them. So you should check that they do not get a second loop on them. But if you remove the loop L, when you move in the second step, when you shift by one half, one half, or in this case, one half minus one half, you can check that none of the loops here get over an edge outside. It's very simple to check. So now the only difficulty is that inside, in step three, maybe you overwrite. Okay, every edge is going to be necessarily on a loop because you say every edge which is not on a loop after step two, I add a loop, basically. Every edge like that, if I'm not on a loop, I add this loop. So of course I'm going to be at least on one loop, but I should check I'm not on two loops. So the thing I need to check is that somehow as soon as I am empty after, as soon as I'm not covered after step two, all the edges around the black face that I'm bordering are not covered as well. And this you can check. It's fairly easy to check that it's true. I think anyway, the picture is kind of uh, compelling, but if you check that, you can, it's a small exercise, you can try to do it to convince yourself that indeed, if there is an edge which is empty after step two, it's in fact all, of, uh, all the edges bordering the black face are empty. Yes? Uh, doesn't it mean that you, you, you don't lose any edges that uh, regardless of the shift, we, we always have like exactly one quarter of the length of loop? Like um, we, we, we have the length of the loop edges and we add four times the number of new loops. So it shouldn't really depend on, on the shift. Uh, on the direction, I'm, so I never check, it's maybe possible, but I'm not sure that every direction will give you n over 4. I, I mean, the number of edges stay the same because it's like all edges? Yeah, but the number of edges is not, uh, it's the number of loops which is important. The number of edges is not involved in, uh, in the, <coughs> the computation. But we had the number of edges equal to the length of loop. Ah, so you are proving to me that it's the same in every direction. That's true, actually. I like it. Very good. One point for you. <laughs> Very nice observation. Indeed, yes. So then, indeed, all directions are the same. That's even better. Good. You see, it's useful to... <laughs> Very good. Very good observation. Okay. So you don't even need to choose the best direction. That's oh, perfect. Now, let's conclude. So we have this mapping. It's a, no, it's a mapping that is working. So what is the only thing I need to check? It's a one-to-one -one mapping. You agree? Because you choose a direction. You just shift in this direction. So if I give you a possible image, you know how to reconstruct because you know what the loop L is. So you, lo you look at the loop L. You, you shift everybody left, and you override by the loop L. So the, the pre-image is work, is, is one to one. I mean, there is only one pre-image. So the only thing I need to check now is that the probability of SL of omega bar is larger than the probability of uh, omega bar. But in this case, if I look at PCQ, uh, GPCQ zero of SL of omega bar, well, this is just square root of q to the number of loops in SL of omega bar minus the number of loops in omega bar times the probability of omega bar, right? But here, by definition, what did I do? Uh, is, yes, okay. Here, what did I do? I, the number of loops in omega bar, I removed the loop at the first step, and then I added n over four loops exactly, since now we know it's <laughs> that. So this thing is exactly square root of q to the n over four minus one. So how do I conclude? Now I just say, okay, if I look at this guy, Well, this is 
by definition, the sum over the omega bar in your set, blah, blah, in this set, of phi 0 g p c q of omega bar. Now I'm going to use this thing to say, okay, this is square root of q to the minus the length, I mean, so square root of q to the 1 minus uh, n over 4, I mean, length of l over 4. Uh, sorry, this is length of l times the sum over the omega bar in your set of phi 0 g p c q of s l of omega bar this time. I just replaced one by the other. But this is what? Because it's one to one, you are not overcounting. This is just g 0 g p c q of s l of your set of l appears. in omega bar. But this is, by definition, then smaller or equal to 1. So all of this, you get this times the sum, which is smaller or equal to 1. So you get smaller than square root of q to the 1 minus n over 4. So really, the idea is that you are going to prove that, I mean, it's a very nice idea, is that you, you want to prove that a set has small probability. OK, what you do is that you say that every configuration in this set can be associated in a unique way. Every guy is associated in a unique way to another set of, I mean, to a configuration in another set, or actually it could even be the same set. It's not relevant. Every guy is associated like that. But every of these guys have much bigger probabilities than these guys. This guy has much smaller probabilities than this guy. This guy has much smaller probabilities than this guy. But the sum of the probabilities here is smaller than 1 anyway. So that means that the sum of the probability here is tiny. And that's uh, the end of the proof. OK? So remember, I mean, that's always the same idea for this pirogov sinai type arguments. The, what, what is changing from one, uh, one proof to the other one is the repair map somehow. And there, the repair mat, I, th I think you can really remember well what it is. Just remove the loop, shift, and override by uh, small uh, loops. OK? Well, we are going to finish here because next week, what we are going to do is, uh, so on Tuesday, we are going to take this time q smaller or equal to 4 and prove that the phase transition is continuous. And you are going to see that there, the argument is going to be completely different. It's going to involve discrete analysis, and, uh, and here it was just counting somehow. It was combinatorics more than anything. Okay? Very good. <laughs>